president of the previous youth collab uh, springboard program uh, in 2000, uh, from 2018 to 2019. Uh, since um, then, he, he has been supporting different entrepreneurs in his own ecosystem in Pakistan as well. And also he has a um, um, company um, called Dasan that's in, um, established a few years ago, uh, which uh, he will introduce more later. Uh, so next, um, I'll pass over to Omar to introduce the session today and, and the speakers. Thank you so much, Aggie. Hello, change makers around the globe. I cordially welcome you to this webinar on advancing gender equality through entrepreneurial innovation and technology. This is a part of the Youth Collab Springboard Program, an initiative co-led by UNDP and the City Foundation. Aligned with this year's theme, Digit All, Innovation and Technology for Gender Equality. The session will focus on educating and inspiring participants by showcasing the impact of gender inclusive entrepreneurship, the enabling factors, and the current challenges as shared by the successful young entrepreneurs themselves. A recently joined published, uh, a, re a report jointly published by Youth Collab, co-led by UNDP and the City Foundation, and UNICEF reveals that how girls as young as 10 have high entrepreneurial intentions, but are unable to be fully supported by the ecosystems. Today, we have a power panel of three amazing women from our ecosystem. Before I introduce them, I would like to give, a, give an overview of what to expect. Gender equality is a global issue and it has complex and interconnected dimensions. Gender equality is recognized as a prerequisite to realizing the sustainable development goals. Unraveling each dimension may not be possible within the short time we have. However, we will touch four pillars. The conversation will start with the barriers women face in their daily lives. We will then transition towards the challenges they encounter at their workplaces and learn how technology is helping them in advancing gender equality within their workplace and the services they provide. Last section will revolve around solutions, ideas, platforms, which may enable women. So it would be really great to hear from you on what kind of technology and innovation is needed to create a gender equal entrepreneurial landscape. So feel free to write your responses as we kickstart this discussion. So let's begin with Shreya. Uh, she is a founder of Happy Minds, a platform providing mental health services in Nepal. So Shreya, tell us your story that how this idea started and what things a girl in Nepal with dreams to start her own business had to face. Over to you, Shreya. Thanks, Omar. Hi, everyone. Uh, so a very short start as to how Happy Minds started is I experienced the mental health gap for a Nepali community while living back in the UK as a student when I struggled to find me a therapist during the most challenging time of my life. So when I did return to Nepal, I initiated a platform to bridge the gap. So it's been a very interesting journey so far. Uh, just to touch on a few of the gender biases in my journey is as such that um, most females in Nepali communities, we are expected to take up on a stable nine to five job. So there is a stigma and we are seen less of in a society when deciding to start our own venture. Um, I really had to fight hard to convince my parents, mostly because I wanted to establish a social enterprise. So it's a small and um, petty things that make the journey difficult for us women entrepreneurs. Um, things like the landlord re won't rent out his property to do an organization led by a female because he doesn't trust that we can run a business and, you know, pay bills on time. Um, not to mention, it is also a lost opportunity to lead a crowd for workshops and such, because I am a young female. Um, again, the case of no faith and trust because of my gender. Um, but shifting on to challenges when serving to female users is also very interesting. So a study shows that most of the digital devices owned by the females here in Nepal are registered and also monitored by the men. 
meaning the fathers, brothers, partners, and so on. So we bridge the gap, the mental health gap through technology, meaning we struggle to reach these women in need who don't have full access to electronic devices and the internet, which has been one of the biggest challenges for me. Okay. So thank you so much, Ria. Uh, moving on, we have Ziana from Pakistan, who founded a platform, Bejlo.pk, which has over 10,000 women solo solopreneurs from small cities of Pakistan. So Ziana, tell us how this idea came into your mind. Was it like a personal struggle or what? Tell us more about the challenges you had to face in setting this up. Absolutely. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having us here. And very similar to Shriya, it was a very personal experience that led to, um, you know, the birth of Bechra.pk. So um, during the beginning of the COVID pandemic, I was based outside Pakistan and my co-founder and I were both visiting Pakistan and we had newborns. Um, so like any mom, I had a certain amount of, uh, you know, have two months worth of uh, clothes and accessories that a child would need. But COVID happened, everything shut down. Um, we were grounded in Pakistan and uh, overnight my child's needs changed and I I, I didn't have access to the bottles he would need or the, the clothes that uh, he would need. Um, so we were recommended by friends and family to turn to Facebook. And they said, there's a lot of Facebook groups here. You'll be able to find anything that you need. And I was blown away. Um, the variety of products that were being sold through Facebook groups, it was not even marketplace, wasn't even functional then. So it was just through buying and selling groups. Uh, and there were women, women only groups. Um, they had everything from anti colic bottles to clothes to shoes to, um, you know, feeding uh, utensils. And I, I was thrilled. I was like, okay, this is great. I can access everything that I need to. But then what I realized was it was a very tedious process to actually make the purchase from them because there was no checkout process. Um, you had to go back and forth between buyers and sellers. I was interested in a product. The seller was interested in selling it to me, but I wouldn't hear back from them in two days. So they would lose out on a sale. I would lose out on something that I needed. Um, so I, I started doing a little bit more research and I come from an e-commerce background. So I've run a, 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 a store through e social commerce before as an Instagram seller. So I knew I had faced these problems as a seller, but I didn't realize there were over 100,000 women who were facing the same problem. So we did some more research and we realized that Women had really good business ideas. They had really good products, but they lacked the digital and financial literacy to be able to grow their business and execute their business into the formal e-commerce space. And that's how that's how we set up uh, Bachelor.pk. Um, there was definitely a lot of challenges in the beginning, specifically with financial and digital literacy, because a lot of the sellers that we were talking to um, for their own personal financial social reasons had missed out on formal education in the early years. So they didn't necessarily know how to you know, manage their finances for a company, for an organization or for selling their product. They didn't know um, how to expect uh, you know, how, much, how many items are going to be sold. Um, so we then developed the platform, Bachelor.pk, which allows them to sell their products to us, but we also developed a training and development program to address the challenges that they were facing um, while they were trying to grow their business. Wow, that is really interesting. So uh, moving on, we have Hester from Epic Angels, who along with 125 women make up Asia's largest female-only investor network. She's currently in Singapore and is always on a lookout for women with dreams. So Esther, tell us more about how and where you started and what barriers you overcame to reach where you are today. Great. Thank you very much, Omar, and, and great to be here. Welcome, everyone. Um, happy to explain a little bit about Epic Angels. So Epic Angels, as you, as you mentioned, is a platform for female investors. Currently, the decision makers in venture capital are 96.7% male. So what does that mean? That the decisions about which innovations and which inner ideas get capital are made by men. So when men think it's not a good idea, the idea does not get funded and probably dies. This is the game that we want to change. So we gather women that are, have achieved a certain level in their career um, to the extent that they have a little bit of money on the side to get to, to fund early stage startups, but more, more to um, help them grow by paying it forward, by mentoring early stage founders with their knowledge and their expertise. So we create access to uh, capital and mentoring for female founders of early stage companies. And on the other side, we increase access for female investors 
two investment opportunities that have female leadership. We stumbled upon this more or less as we started with a group of friends, just five women on Wednesday night, literally with a bottle of wine every Wednesday, looking at demo days on YouTube, discussing, would you invest in this? Because we had so many questions, but we were actually a little bit daunted by the male um, scene that venture capital is. So how do you break into this and where do you ask all your stupid questions that you have in the beginning? So we thought we set up our own little group and ask each other these questions and just start figuring it out. We made one investment actually in Bangladesh, a health tech. Uh, and that is when founders started to come to us asking, would you like to invest in my company? Now, what can you do with five women? But that was for us the key to understand that there was not only a need with women to uh, invest in early stage startups that have female leadership, but also, also with startups to have more female investors because the advisory board, the cap table, the ownership, et cetera, all plays a huge part in the introductions that are being made, the access to markets, the access to talent, all these critical things that make a company successful. So this is when... Um, me and my co-founder, Micah, decided that we would like to build this out. Uh, we set up the whole backend in November 2021. We said, okay, whoever wants to join can join. Uh, and today we are with 126 women, uh, all in uh, APEC region. So we have 80% in Singapore, but we span uh, also uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Korea, uh, and, and uh, also South Asia. Uh, we invest in early stage startups, so from pre-seed until series A, uh, and we, we syndicate our uh, investments. So we make investing actually very accessible with lower ticket sizes than what you typically would see in VC. Wow, that, that's really fun. amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Hester. So uh, now we'll talk a little bit more about how personal brands of our panelists are advancing gender equality in their communities. So Hester, continuing with you, uh, I would request that you tell us how Epic Angels emp empower the Epic Women Founders. So there are like many women entrepreneurs in this session who would just want to know a step-by-step -step process or a list of services that your particular brand offers. So can you elaborate a little bit on that? And then we'll move to the rest of the bandit. Yeah, sure. So um, in essence, we have a very standard deal flow process where, where founders can apply to our platform via our website, and then it comes to our attention and we review it. The value that we add in that particular step already is that we always come back with feedback. So we allow only startups to apply to us when there's at least one female in the core team. It can be male founded, but at least, so that comes down to let's say 30% ownership, equity, uh, uh, female. So we always come back either when there is a fit with our investment focus or not, we always provide constructive feedback when we say uh, there is no fit. When there is a fit, we really work uh, very hands-on with all the angels in our network to um, create this partnership and also see how good of a partner we can be. So what, what they need from an investor more than just money, for example, expertise in entering new markets in Southeast Asia, um, on uh, uh, the go-to-market strategy for B2B, for example, there's all sorts of things. And that's the beauty about having such a large network. There is expertise in all industries that you can imagine and in all sorts of, of functions that you can imagine. So um, it is likely that we will be able to match the founder with an expert of some sort to uh, continue growing the business. Wow, really amazing. Thank you so much, Esther, for these uh, insights. So now I would request Ziana to show her show how her platform is advancing gender equality. So Ziana, tell us, is it just like women? Is it like a women-only platform or out, women outside Pakistan can also use this platform? Tell us a little bit in more detail that how women can become financially independent through Bachelor.tk. 
Thank you so much. So uh, it's at the moment we're based only in Pakistan, uh, but through the uh, youth collab program that we were part of last year, we identified that there's the same issues and the same barriers are being faced um, in other emerging markets as well. So that's definitely something we're going to look into in the future. Um, but one of the reasons that, so Pakistan has the second lowest um, labor force participation rate by females in the world, and we have a population of 100 million women. Um, a key, two key barriers to that is uh, lack of education. Uh, as well as lack of social mobility. This uh, setup for joining the formal workforce in Pakistan, like many other countries, is the expectation that you can leave home from nine to five and you do not have um, any restrictions on being able to get around, uh, physically get around in, in a city. Um, in Pakistan, women have, uh, especially in smaller cities uh, where the ma majority of our population lies, um, they have a lot of family obligations, they have a lot of social obligations, they don't have access to the education where they can um, hire, uh, you know, support for their, for their children to watch their children when they go to work. So the main need that we identified in Pakistan uh, in order to achieve gender equality, to, to achieve financial independence is the ability to earn an income from home in a flexible way. Uh, and because of COVID, we were forced into this digital boom where over 100 million people got access to the internet within a span of two years and adaptability to the internet started increasing very rapidly. So people now had access to smartphones in their homes and we wanted them to use that smartphone to be able to earn an income. So this, the, the second they start selling products and they start receiving income, initially our sellers would receive their income in a husband's or a father's or a brother's bank account. Um, where they were definitely earning the income, but they didn't necessarily have control over that income. So through our program, while talking to them, we explained to them that, okay, you know, these are digital wallets. These are now becoming easier for you to set up. We'll help you to set it up. Why don't you receive the payments in your own accounts? That gives them the financial independence, the financial inclusion that's needed for the economy to prosper in a formal e with the formal e-commerce economy. Right now, the way that they're working is they're not being able to be counted as, as the formal workforce because they don't have bank accounts in their names. They don't have um, access to uh, these services. So through Bachelor of Pico, we're bringing those services to them and they are in their own communities. We've seen that they are now be being able to tell each other about it and they're all the women together in certain cities and towns are coming up. They're becoming more financially independent. They're making decisions on their children's health care, on their parents' health care. They have money now to put aside um, and they have the confidence to say, I want my child to go to this school and I'm going to be able to pay for it. So we've really seen in a very short span of time the impact that it's being able to create, to be able to create a working environment that suits the lifestyles of the women that we're talking to. Oh, this is really exciting because uh, I, I personally feel that we have, when I as, I as a male, we really don't think about this. Like we take everything for granted, but for the way you ex explained the thing, it really opened my eyes as well. So uh, thank you so much for doing this amazing work, Ziana. Uh, we have, now let's move on. We are aware of the fact that achieving gender equality means eliminating gender-based discrimination, violence, stereotype, and promoting equal representation and participation of all genders in all spheres of life. However, when it comes to accessing healthcare, just like you said, Ziana, uh, the situation is very dire for women. So now I'll ask our next panelist, Shriya, can you explain some stories or share some stories on what Happy Minds folk found out when they started operations and how you are helping in advancing gender equality through your services? So over to you, Shriya. Okay. So um, we started during the COVID-19 pandemic. Within two days of operation, we had over 800 inquiries amongst which were a lot of women who needed support, um, but lacked access to finance and security to even you know, seek for counseling. So um, understanding the pain of the females, which were the majority of them, we introduced employee assistant program in Nepal. So we partner with communities, corporate houses, and um, educational institutions to offer free access to mental health supports that's been so sponsored by the organization. Um, and now in less than two years of operations, we have directly impacted more than 18,000 individuals, where um, more than 65% of them are women. So through this initiative, we are advancing gender equality as we offer equal access to healthcare. Um, making well-being a priority. 
which has now shown more impact on working women, especially married and uh, married women and mothers. And um, to encourage these women, we operate seven days a week to give them an environment to suit their commitments as well. And um, we offer 24 seven running hotline services for them to seek support in case of emergency, where the most common cases has been about domestic violence, harassment, stress, work-life balance, and so on. Nice. So is it like uh, online or do you also have like a physical setup where you provide these services? We do have physical um, facilities as well. However, we've done a research and it shows that more than 80% of people still choose to go for online services because they can be at the comfort of their office or wherever they are. And it gives them the flexibility to book in a counseling session for early morning or like 6 a.m. or like late evening before bed. So um, in spite of having the both of the services, people still choose to go for online mostly. And one more question out of curiosity. So the service providers that are connect, associated with your brand, are they primarily uh, uh, women, women or men? So can you tell us a little bit about the distribution of that? Because I yes. personally have seen that the, the, the balance is a little bit off mostly. Yeah, so I think um, psychology as a mental health sector is one of the sector that is being led by females. So there's a lot of female counselors here in Nepal. And even in, within my team, I have a pool of almost 20 mental health professionals where I think almost 15 to 16 of them are females. Okay, cool. So uh, Priya, can you please tell us how women seek help using technology? Like what options are available out there? Community groups, platforms, allies? Anything in particular that you would like to mention, please educate us. We have like a lot of people who are really looking forward to getting that awareness. Okay. Uh, so the blessing of technology has been access to information, um, reaching to people for support and advice um, has given big about injustice and biasness and um, build groups to support a fellow woman. Um, for me, I depend on research and pick my mentors. Um, I've reached out to them mostly on LinkedIn and connected with amazing organizations who understand my vision and challenges. Uh, just to name a few on top of my head would be UNDP Nepal and Impact Hub. Um, the government hotlines and organizations like Happy Minds, we offer consultations that are free of cost and even offer um, aftercare services when people are in need. So I think taking the first step to seeking help is difficult, but um, technology and advancing innovations are there. So any sort of gap can be bridged and any sort of help can be found. Uh, it's just that we must know that um, we don't put ourselves back and put ourselves at least first step forwards towards reaching the help and the help is there. Okay, thank you so much, Ria, for sharing all that information. So now moving on to Ziana. So Ziana, your platform is essentially a marketplace. So what have you observed so far about the market response? So does technology really help women? What are some of the impactful stories from your community and the ripple effects that you have seen happening in, a pro in Pakistan? So inspire us. Absolutely. So, I mean, technology for us has been the driving force, especially in, in the sector that we're working, which is women from uh, smaller cities, tier two and tier three cities, as we call them, from a low to middle income background. Um, technology has changed the way they um, access um, products the way they access information, the way they access healthcare. Um, so one of our um, very early buyers was um, a lady who was from Gujarawala and she, she had a newborn baby and she was looking for a specific anti-colic bottle for her child. The doctor, she had gone to a doctor in, in that town. They had said, oh, this child is colic. The child was up crying all night. And in her city, she wasn't able to find um, the products. Now, women are, these women are not necessarily literate enough to know how to browse through websites. Um, so our, the way we reach them is through social media. So we're on Instagram stories, when Instagram reels, we talk to influencers. So she came across the page 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 um, where we had done, a, a, our stories had mentioned that we had these anti-colic bottles. And because our sellers, a lot of the times, are people who are selling products they may have at home, um, or they may have products that they have sourced from the wholesale market, the prices are relatively lower. So this buyer reached out to us and said, you know, I really need this bottle. Um, how do I get it from you? How, how does this work? How, how can I buy something that's on a picture in, in a website, in, in a social media page? So we were giving 
basically through technology, women are now getting access to products that they didn't know A, existed. They didn't know how to reach unless it was in a physical store. So it's a huge mindset change that's coming through technology, especially through social commerce. So, you know, we were lucky enough, we shipped it out to her and, you know, within three days, she was thanking us and saying that, you know, my child is now sleeping better, they're feeding better. Um, you know, so even impacts like that, it, it just changes things for you. And then we have a, a university student, again, one of our very early sellers, very loyal, uh, very loyal buyers, and who is now also a seller on our platform. She was the first girl in her family to go to university very high achiever but she was going to university where she was feeling a little bit intimidated she wanted to dress like the other girls were dressing she had this aspiration to wear high street brands but her budget restricted her so she came across our platform and she saw that we were selling pre-owned items things that had been worn before um there were high street brands in great condition that she now had access to and it fell within her budget so she started buying from us and she shared the stories about how then her friends other girls like her looked to her and she was very open about the fact that she was buying pre-owned items. Um, there's a huge stigma in Pakistan attached to the buying and selling of, of pre-owned items, but she was proud and she was telling people about it. And from her university, from her community, we've had so many buyers come in and now those buyers are turning into sellers. So they have worn these products for now six or eight months. They're still in great condition. So they're going ahead and selling it forward. So, you know, you really see the impact and you see the fact that as these women are getting, you know, $30, $40, $50 of an income a month, they can now choose where to spend it. They're, they're sending their kids to, to after school classes. They're selling their kids to a small football club that's happening in their area because they can now give them the experience. And the, the whole point of Patreon.pk is to make e-commerce easy, affordable, and accessible. These women would generally spend more time in their homes, in their local areas within a five kilometer radius. So the fact that they can now access products across the city, um, from larger cities, from smaller cities, from the north, from the south, that's what technology is bringing. That's how technology is changing and innovating and really helping people um, across Pakistan, across small cities, um, access things that were previously untapped. So, uh, Ziana, I have like a couple of follow-up questions regarding to that. So, when we talk about marketplace and again, women accessing marketplaces, so they are all there are other marketplaces that exist in Pakistan as well, like the Raz and uh, other platforms as well. So, do you think that um, the pr products or the range you have makes you competitive or makes you better? or makes you the platform which women prefer? Or uh, is there any other reason that you would like to share with our audience? So basically the, the main idea of Pacer.pk is yes, we're a marketplace like any other marketplace, but it's about the curation of the selection of the product and diversity that we offer and also how people find us. So we're a social commerce marketplace. Uh, people find us through their social media. So where we they are spending two to three hours a day on their Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagrams. And that's how they're coming across us. Our audience doesn't necessarily know how to go into a Google search and spell the items that they're looking for. So it has to be very visual. So it's the way that our community is accessing us. It's the product mix that we have to offer. And it's the fact that we have unique products. So especially in the pre-owned space or in the small business space, the products that we're selling are not mass produced. They're not available all over. They're not available with large retailers. So women, and they're very women focused. So all the products we have, you're going to notice how, are things that women will mostly buy, you know, unless it's a male shopping for their, their, you know, female counterparts. So that's how we differ from a lot of the other marketplaces in the industry. And it's again, because the only reason we were able to come up with this is also that we are female founders. A lot of times men will not understand the challenges, will not experience the challenges, or will not even know that these Facebook groups that have 30, 40, 50,000 female sellers even exist because men aren't allowed on those groups for a safety and security point of view. Um, so our advantage is that we are women leading this change and that's how we're being able to penetrate the market very effectively at a very low cost. And another question that I have, like, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the insights on what products are most famous? Like, is it just the clothes or is it just the baby items or anything in particular? Because I think there are a lot of women founders here and they might be working in a similar idea in their country. So maybe they can learn a thing or two from you. Right. So we actually started off with having three types of sellers on board. So when we did our research, we realized, okay, there are small businesses that are selling products, people who are coming up with their own fashion lines, hair care, beauty lines. And then there's people who are called resellers who either import items or buy items from the wholesale market and resell them at a slight profit. And then we tried to introduce what's called pre-loved items, which is items that have been used. 
our idea, our initial research showed that the small businesses would be the most successful. The main areas would be the large metropolitan cities like Karachi, Lahore, Islamabad. But our actual customer base is completely different. So we've seen the highest uptake in the pre-loved markets. Um, high street brands that are being sold at about a third or a quarter of the price in great condition. And that's where that's where our sales have come from. Um, so pre-loved, whether it's for women, whether it's for children, we've seen a huge uptick in toys and books. So those are things that people have really taken to for their children. Um, because again, we're accessing a market who didn't really necessarily have stuffed toys or did not necessarily have learning toys for their children uh, previously, yeah. because it was always seen as kind of a luxury. But now they can access those at a price point and they become aware of it. So until you're confined to shopping in person in a small city, you don't even know what else is out there. And through, you know, Betro.pk and technology, they're basically now accessing these, these products. And uh, we've seen a huge uh, uptake in the pre-love sector for sure. So I, that's definitely something we didn't anticipate. We thought it was going to be really hard to work on the stigma attached to this. But uh, I think I think right now women are curious, they're excited, they want to know what's out there and they want to make the best choices for them and their families, irrespective of the social stigma, which I think is a really empowering aspect as well. Wow, that's really amazing. Thank you so much, Diana, for sharing all those amazing stories from your platform. Now I'll move to our next panelist. So Hester, you have worked with like a lot of women throughout your life. So we would like to know that what is the role of technology in Epic Angels? So does it help in advancing gender equality? And like, have you seen any entrepreneurial innovation mushrooming in the community? So educate us. Uh, yeah, the platform itself is an example of how technology can provide access to large scale um, where previously that was not accessible. So through our platform, we can reach uh, large numbers of female investors who are able to support female founders elsewhere in the world uh, uh, and and that is kind of a marketplace that that platform actually works and it doesn't require high tech i mean we built it all ourselves there is uh, no one else who came there so so that is uh that is quite quite easy and I, I just want to um jump into uh something that shria said indeed like that the mental uh, health industry is considered a female industry um, and there's an interesting mechanism that is probably interesting also to know for the female founders on this call that um, unconsciously people consider certain industries male or female so for example mental health is a female considered industry same as fashion uh, so so that is uh, where is Jana where, where you are in um same for travel that is a bit in between but more considered female than male and then there's of course the the, the, the male considered industries like uh, cars and, and and things like this now um an unconscious bias in investors which is good to be aware of is that uh men can make products and services for both male and female industries so there is no funding difference for male founders whether they have a product for male or female industry. However, for female, female founders are 10 times less likely to raise funds if they have a product or a service that targets male industries. So this is good to understand when, where, what is your industry and how is that perceived? Um, uh, because it may influence the, 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 the funds that you, that you may raise. So that is something that I think we're already uh, kind of dealing with, as I understand from Shreya this understanding. Um, coming back to your question, I think that the pure tech is uh, is what we see in a few brilliant cases that we have actually supported. Uh, one is actually in Pakistan. Uh, Ziana, you probably know them. It's uh, Sehat Kahani. It's uh, two female yes. doctors um, who Sarah. use tech for for to to enhance the chances for women. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because you're from Pakistan, I'm not. But what I understood from the founders, um, they both studied medicine. They actually loved medicine and practicing medicine. They uh, found out that when they found their husband, that many women actually uh, study medicine to become good doctor brides at 70 to 80 yes. percent go study medicine to become doctor brides and then that's it right so you still become a housewife taking care of the children at the home um these two founders found themselves actually love pra practicing medicine 
found themselves at home with their babies feeling stuck. It's like, this is not what I did this for. And hence they created this platform for female doctors uh, and moms and whatever other roles they have to actually be able to continue practicing medicine while also taking care of the home and the children. So very flexible working schemes, uh, uh, bringing together the, the patient and the doctor through this platform, benefiting both sides. So both the female medicine practitioner, doctor, and, and, the, and the patient. So this is one example where tech can really, really help advance the chances for women. Thank you. I, I, I have like two more questions from you, Hester. So when you listen to pitches, uh, many founders come to your platform and pitch. So what kind of ideas do you usually see? What kind of trend is in the market? Like, are the ideas related to just marketplaces or is it like deep tech or is it related to wanted entertainment or travel industry? So what kind of ideas you are usually getting? And I would like to know from a perspective of female. So are there like enough female founders applying to Epic Angels and what kind of ideas they are having? And yeah. if you can just give a little bit of comparison. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a good question, but I honestly don't think that there's a differentiation uh, in the industry that female founders typically target. What I do see is that female founders usually have gotten their idea for their business based on a personal experience. So either, for example, they have fallen ill and uh, felt uh, that they needed therapy uh, and then they did not have access to therapy on the moments that they really, really needed it. So hence they set up a platform for kind of demand therapy, therapy on demand anytime, anywhere, as an example, or um, uh, indeed uh so family businesses in a certain industry, we had another one from India the other day where uh, there was very deep in construction. So very male industry, female founder, her family was in construction for generations and she had seen the inefficiencies between job site managers and construction workers who are day, daily wage workers um, where that goes wrong. So this is how she came up with, with her solution, bringing creating a super app basically to make more efficient matches, but also to uh, protect the rights of the daily wage workers and on the other side of the job site managers to be able to do compliance, KYC checks, et cetera, and also to be able to communicate with the workers during a job. So these are, that's the difference that I do see where men seem to be able to distance themselves and their personal experiences more from the actual product they're building. Many times female founders um, have been triggered to build a product based on a personal experience, which is good and bad. The good part is that um, it adds a lot of passion and therefore resilience because being a founder is often romanticized, but is not easy at all, right? You get punched in the face three times a week and you have to keep going. So a good portion of passion is actually very good in order to have that grit and resilience to go on and go on and go on. Um, on the other hand, uh, it it makes it very own in that sense that um, it's hard to leave. So when the product market fit is not found, which and we we focus on early stage, so that's typically when the product market fit is not found yet. Uh, when there is no market apparently for the product, it's very hard to pivot, and that agility is also what makes up a good founder. So it's Thank it's you. a difficult place to be in. Yeah. Yeah. So these were really amazing things that I learned from you today. So thank you so much for the amazing power pack discussion, all the panelists. Now, before we open the floor for questions, I have like one quick liner from each of our panelists. Question would be same from everyone. So the question is, what is your vision for 2033? So that's like 10 years from now. So first we'll go with Hester, Ziana, and then Shriya. So Hester, one line. More female investors. Okay, 50 more female, female investors. investors. Let's put a number to okay. it. Okay, so Ziana, one line there. What is your vision for 2033? Uh, Pakistan's female participation, labor participation was, goes up at least 10%, and we become active, financially included uh, part of the economy. Okay, financial inclusion. Got it. So, Shriya, what is your vision for 2033? to build a global community where more women focus on their mental health as much as their physical health. Okay, thank you so much, all the panelists for this amazing discussion. I think if I, I learned so much. I think uh, 
I have been on many panels, but I've never been on one where women were in majority, and I had to learn so many things from so many amazing uh, women. So I'll hand back the mic back to Tamha. Uh, if you would continue from here, and we are op- we have opened the floor for questions. So all the amazing entrepreneurs who are in the call, please pick our brains to ask questions. This is your chance. The stage is yours. Okay, I can see some raised hands. Ashwarya. If I'm pronouncing it right. Maybe I have a question for the audience. Another thing that we have uh, touched upon a little bit, but not entirely, is the role uh, of role models. Um, Very, very important. Before I went in the whole startup scene, I was in uh, corporate life for more than 15 years in four different countries. There I had amazing role models, females, who made key introductions, who vouched for me, gave me projects, etc. Being a female uh, with children, the only one in the team, right? It was only men. Uh, so you need that support somehow. And now again, I see it that the angel investors in our network, how they are a role model for female founders, that is actually feasible and to step up and to actually take the fear out of things like pitching uh, all filled with bias that that creates a a lack of confidence which leads to raising less funds so the role of role models I think is very 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 important and that would be actually my core wish that there's more role models for females to step up so I would like to understand do you have access to role models and if not what are you lacking what do you need Okay, this is a great question. So audience, now you are becoming the speaker. Please tell us who is your role model. And I'll also give the mic back to Aggie. So Aggie, if you can take over from here. Thank you so much, Omar. Thank you so much, Sayana, Shreena, and Hester for the fruitful for conversation um, that um, as, a, as a great uh, discussion that will lead up to the International Women's Day this year. Um, so I saw there are a few questions in the chat as well. Um, so there's a question from Xi Ming uh, from the Social Laboratory. Um, she asked, uh, gender equality means making chances fair to for men and female. Um, which means chances equally distribute to the different genders or simply meaning providing more opportunities to female. Um, anyone who has um, any uh, response to this question? I think it's a very good question. And uh, uh, I, I would tend to say the first. So fair chances for male and female, because you need both sides to have the balance. It's all about balance. It's not about more of the one than the other. It's, it's about balance. So, um, which sometimes yeah. means you need to create more opportunities for female, but that's more a means to an end. And the end is the, the fair chances for both sides. Yeah, I think I agree as well. Giving equal opportunity to both is equality, but where you think um, a certain female does not have access to a platform and you see the potential in her and would like to give that, then I think that leads towards gender equity. So the difference between equality and equity. And there's a question from Roshan. Um, if any other speakers has any thoughts on this, feel free to jump in as well. Also, of reading the question in the chat, um, this is for um, Zaina. What's the percent of commission you take to sustain the marketplace through a business? Right. So we uh, we charge a seventeen percent commission um, from our sellers. So that's only paid once they make a sale. So there's no setup or there's no subscription fee. Um, and then the customer also pays for shipping. Um, we do, however, recognize that a commission-based model is not necessarily going to be the way to sustain our business. So we do have other revenue streams that we can in place. Um, if you are interested in a marketplace model, please do feel free to reach out to me and we can go over things in a lot more detail because I learned a lot from the Youth Collab program last year, a lot of the challenges and barriers that were being faced across the region. So I know there's definitely a lot of scope out there um, for this kind of a setup in other countries as well. Thank you so much, Saina. Also, um, I, I will encourage all the speakers to share your linking link in the, in the chat as well. Um, so the participants can reach out to you after connect with you. Uh, if there is um, any more questions or any 
um, interesting collaboration as well. Um, so in terms of role model, um, Fang Qing shared, um, honestly never had a role founder role, uh, role model growing up. Uh, it was hard, uh, but now it's Melanie Perkins. Um, for anyone who doesn't, um, uh, who are not very familiar with the name. Uh, so Melanie was the founder of Canva, um, which is the daily use tool we are familiar with to create very beautiful graphics. Um, so thanks so much for all the speakers share your link in the chat as well. Um, and thank you, thank you so much for taking the time to join the panel. Um, uh, good to see everyone, um, you know, from our partners, um, Hester, um, has been really inspiring setting as a model herself and also all the amazing uh, female entrepreneurs we have in the Youth Collab Springboard as well, uh, Shreya, Zana, and also Omer. Uh, I know you have done a lot of um, activities um, in terms of women empowerment as well. Um, so very, very lucky to have all of you on the same tech panel. Um, so next we'll move on to the feedback session. Uh, so today, um, Omar has uh, kindly suggested a new song we'll play during uh, the feedback session. Uh, so we have reading, uh, we have read all of your feedback forms, and thank you so much also to share how's your week been so far um, in, in in the in the in the form and also share with us uh, what excites you. Um, we saw a lot of um, amazing updates on product launch, a lot of updates on you know um, new features on the website and then building partnership and joining back demo days. Um, and um, yeah, Shamha, do you have anything to add? Sorry, Aki. I think um, just to say hi, it's been a, a very interesting discussion. Just Aki to mention that I think there's one last question in the chat box in case our speakers would like to address it as well. Thank you. Thank you so much Shamha, for the reminder. Um, we have a question from Ashraw. Um, Ashraw, Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> please guide me how to pronounce the name. Uh, so question for Hester, uh, what's in your understanding opinion are the barriers or the reasons that we struggle to have a gender balanced funding panels? Um, when we have female investors interested, we still seem to have less of them showing up in a lot of VC decisions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And there's another question for Shreya as well. Have you found in the context of Nepal a possible shortage of um, MPHs for the ones who would like to or want to access these services? Um, so maybe um, over to you, Hester. Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. I. I can only think that it's globally the same issue where females also uh, suffer from this unconscious bias that an investor is not a female. An investor is a male person. Um, so they don't see themselves fit this persona. Uh, that's exactly the, the, the issue that we are trying to solve. Um, it has a lot to do with culture. It has a lot to do, again, with role models and support platforms. Um, it sounds a bit cheesy, but this safe space where investment is all about money and status and ego. So there's a very male trait, so to speak. So to to break into this is often found very difficult and, and even appalling by women. So to have this platform is very important. And I think there's still a long way to go. There's 2.4% of all the decision makers in venture capital are female. That's 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 a terrible statistic. Um, it has a lot to do with unconscious bias, uh, how we see ourselves and, and accessibility. Um, it has to start one at a time. Um, I would love to understand, I know a few, I know actually uh, some platforms for female VCs in India. So if you like, I can connect you with the people who run these platforms, uh, if you would like to have more access to female uh, investors. Thank you, Hester. That'll be great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Maybe Shreya, there was also a question for you. Yeah. Uh, in con possible shortage. So I think it's a really interesting question. So to give you an interesting fact as well, in a so Nepal's population is thirty million. 
for a population of 30 million, we only have 31 registered clinical psychologists and only a handful of counseling psychologists. So for every one mental health professional, we have around 100,000 um, Nepali that we can allocate, meaning there's a severe shortage of mental health professionals here in Nepal. So um, I myself do struggle to find um, a really nice and educated and empathetic mental health professional, but I do understand that one of the common issue of my country here in Nepal is uh, may, um, where a lot of young people go abroad for work. So I also understand that there are really well-educated and diverse mental health Nepali professionals who's been operating outside. So my mental health professionals are also based in India and Australia, who are studying amazing uh, and very diverse mental health streamlines like criminal psychology and EAP itself as well. So I tend to connect um, the users who are based abroad to the professionals there and also exchange the resources. So uh, just to answer your question, yes, there is a massive shortage of um, mental health professionals here in Nepal. Thank you, Shreya. That really helps. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shura and Hester. Um, so also Nava from Together for Good also share when it comes to role models, there can be formal and formal role models. Um, so I'm very thankful to have both and in the last few years, I've been engaged with lots of programs that has mentorship for women. Um, for example, we do, um, and reading out advisors who are women and some men who are allies. Um, so thank you so much for sharing. Um, and um, next we'll move to the feedback session. Uh, we'll, uh, as I mentioned, we'll play a song as suggested by Omar. And then after that, we'll take a group photo together um, to uh, end today's session. Um, one more comments from Milan. Uh, the problem I see is many women tend to hide behind men and are very reluctant to come forward. We ourselves start the strength and what did and how we can make a difference in many lives. So how can we put women up or how can we push ourselves forward? That's a question for um, the speakers as well. Um, so I will share the feedback form here. Uh, if any speakers would like respond to this question, uh, feel free to jump in as well. Um, in, my, in my experience, a lot has to do with network. Um, and I know this is also very culturally dependent. Uh, in some cultures, it is not common for women to, to create connections with men or the other way around for men to reach out to women to connect. Uh, so I'm very aware of this, but it starts with network, in my uh, opinion, where it starts one by one. So if there's people who can make the introduction and pull that woman behind the back of the man and say, look, this is she and she and she can do this and that that already helps a lot so again it's this kind of sponsor uh, that starts creating those connections uh, because that's where the ball starts rolling sometimes this vacuum needs to be created and it's also it's uncomfortable or not appropriate for women to step up and and make a lot of noise themselves in that case you need somebody else but recognize also when you are that person when you know of somebody that tends to hide behind back, but is actually can add great value to a certain uh, situation or person, then make that introduction. It's not only, we're not only the subject, right? We're also the actor. So think critically of what your role can be and which stretch and vacuum you can actually uh, uh, help create. It's in the little things. It, it doesn't have to be big, it's in the little things. And just to add up on what Hester has mentioned, I do think networking does put on a lot of value when you're trying to um, build as build and grow, basically. But um, for me, how do I um, grow myself or pull myself upward? Because you don't necessarily have good days every day. So I basically harvest for my rainy days. I have a vision board where I write it up and uh, make it really fancy and aesthetics to make sure that I am reminded every day as to why is it that I'm starting and why am I here? Because sometimes when you're in between a lot of stress, it, nothing makes sense. 
Uh, and along the vision board, I have an appreciation board where I make sure to leave myself little notes as to um, how I can remind myself of the small and big wins that I've achieved for the day. So the days when I don't feel like waking up or the days where I have really low confidence is I just go up to the board and I see the small and big wins that I've achieved. So these are the small motivators that sometimes really helps me pull myself um, forward. So maybe if this suggestion can also help someone, then that would be great. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I love the idea of vision board. Um, I also have a small collection of all the, <laughs> um, all the, all the, all the amazing updates from um, all of you as well to inspire, uh, you know, the whole um, vision board team. Um, so thank you again so much to all of our speakers and our awesome moderator as well. I think uh, it's been such a great time learning from all of you. Uh, thanks so much to also to uh, our team, uh, Shrang and Shamha for um, writing up the concept note to make this happen. And thank you everyone for joining the Springboard Plus session. Uh, we do this every week. Uh, so obviously I'll see all of you next week uh, until... Uh, the many many months more to go until june and beyond so now until summer so see you all have a fabulous uh week and until then take care of yourself and if you can someone else also thank you again bye bye, bye. thank you bye.